Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Historical Sew Along series, where we'll take you through the ins and outs of some simple historical sewing projects to build up your wardrobe and your hand skills, maybe even both at the same time. From prep work to finished product, we'll do it together, following step-by-step instructions with some tips and tricks sprinkled in along the way. This series is meant for all skill levels, but it is especially nice for beginners to build confidence while building a solid toolkit of techniques. So feel free to pause, rewind, rewatch, and fast forward to whichever parts you need as many times as necessary. So with all of that said, let's get to the good stuff. Hey everyone, Christina here with Burnley and Trowbridge, and we are back with another sew along for you that we hope you will enjoy. If you don't enjoy them, you should really tell us though, because this is a lot of work if you're not digging it. And today we are going to start by taking the measure, drafting the diagram, and cutting out the pieces for a shift. Now, some of you that watched our last series of sew-alongs asked if we could include a short about this item segment in our future sew-alongs, and so we did. Uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy a two-minute talk on shifts or you can use the index in the description below to skip ahead and get right to your prep work if you're not interested. A shift by any other name would smell as sweet. If you are coming to the Anglo 18th century from another culture or even another time period, you are probably familiar with the concept of a shift some undergarment that is worn beneath the clothing to protect the body and protect the clothing, but it may be called something different. For instance, in the 18th century, the French are calling it a chemise. Before the 18th century, the English are calling it a smock. Italians have a name for it. Germans have a name for it. I'm not going to pronounce them because I would probably do it very poorly, but my point is everyone has a version of this garment and they refer to it by whatever name is specific to that culture. Because we are dealing largely with 18th century British culture, we are going to go ahead and be using shift as the term in this video. Now, as I said, shifts are the first layer of clothing to touch the body, and really most of the time they are the only thing that touches the body, apart from maybe the stockings and potentially cuffs or collars that are added later on. The reason for this is twofold. As underwear, shifts are protecting our clothes from our body, but they also protect our body from our clothes. It's basically a way to help keep your outer clothing clean while also keeping your body clean at the same time. So people in the 18th century aren't necessarily walking around smelling like refuse piles and in general stinking all the time. They actually do care about hygiene. They just deal with hygiene a little bit differently than we do today. They change their shifts regularly. They boil them. So they're washing them really aggressively. And this is going to help keep their shifts clean or shirts if we're talking about men too. Uh, but that will then in turn help keep their bodies clean. In terms of the historical record, dating shifts can be a little bit tricky, simply because the construction methods seem to be pretty consistent over time, and honestly, there aren't a ton of them that exist today. There are a fair number, but certainly not enough to see every different type of shift that we know was available in the 18th century. And also, a lot of the shifts that survive don't necessarily have great provenance, so we don't necessarily know, with very few exceptions, where it came from, who wore it, when it came from, which is also very important, and that can make it a little bit more difficult to really put an accurate timeline on this garment. Of course, the extant record isn't the only thing that we use when we are examining a garment in a historical context. We'll look at the visual record and the written record as well. Uh, the visual record, there are some references to shifts that we see in artwork or paintings, portraits, prints. However, they are nowhere near as plenty as depictions of people who are fully clothed. And I would show you some of them in the video today, but most of them are not very family friendly and this ain't that kind of show. So you just have to keep your eyes open to find those little nuggets of people who are not completely dressed in the visual record. In terms of the written record, sometimes it can be very helpful because it can explain something that we have seen in a picture. Sometimes it just creates more questions than it answers. <laughs> 
Our job when we are recreating any type of garment is just to look at all of the evidence and come to the best conclusion possible at this time. Knowing that tomorrow something new might be introduced that we didn't know before and our entire idea of what shifts look like could change. And that's okay. All right, so now that we have touched briefly on terminology, purpose, and methodology, let's get to what you're all actually here for, making a shift. The first thing that I would recommend that you do is to wash your shift fabric on the hottest cycle that you can. I cannot stress this enough. If you are planning on wearing your shift all day long at a historical site or at an event, particularly if you are going to be wearing it a lot in the summer or in a very humid environment, pre-washing your shift on the hottest setting possible to pre-shrink that linen as much as you can is going to save you so much heartache later on. Pre-washing is also important for the long-term care of the garment. You want to wash it the way that you're going to wash the finished garment. And let me tell you, you are going to need to wash your shift on hot because it is going to get stinky. And if you're not washing it on hot after each wearing, eventually you're going to get some buildup deposits in that area of the garment that can damage the fabric long-term and also make it uncomfortable and gross feeling to wear. Now, if you don't have your fabric yet, don't panic. We are actually going to start by taking some general measurements and diagramming our shift on paper. And I think this is an important first step before we cut into fabric, especially on a garment as large as this is with as many pieces as it has, because it's going to do a few things. It's gonna make sure that we don't make as many mistakes maybe when we're cutting our actual shift, but it's also going to help us cut economically. So we're going to be able to really visualize where each piece is going to be cut from so that we're wasting as little fabric as possible. And that's really important to the 18th century mindset because fabric really is the investment in your wardrobe. So you don't wanna waste it if you don't have to. So let's go ahead and gather our supplies. We've got our linen, we've got paper. Uh, I'm using a pencil with an eraser just in case I make any errors. You could use whatever writing utensil you want. Uh, straight edges. Uh, okay, this is the one time that you math people are gonna be really, really happy because I do have a tape measure. You can see how often I use tape measures. Um, and we probably are going to be using some numbers for this one. You're welcome. Now the shift that we're going to be working on today is actually a style of shift that is pretty well appropriate for the last, say, 30 years or so of the 18th century. It's based on this image coming from the work of Garçon. It dates to 1771. Now you'll notice there is no cuff on the shift sleeve. This is a straight sleeve, but for beginners, I think this is a really good style because shift cuffs are really where we see just like on men's shirts, some of that really, really fine uh, top stitching. And I think for a beginner, that might be a little bit too advanced. We are going to need to take a handful of measures to diagram our shift. And yes, this is one of the few instances where I would recommend using a tape measure because honestly, this is one of the times that it is helpful as a modern sewer recreating this garment to have numbers because linen in the 18th century was very frequently woven to width which means the size of the shift or sometimes even the shirt is dependent on the width of the fabric. We are working with linen that was produced on modern looms and it is the best linen that we can get a hold of today, but it doesn't compare to linen of the 18th century. Anyways, now that I'm off of that tangent as to why I'm using a tape measure after I have told you all that I hate using tape measures, <laughs> there are times where they are really applicable and this just happens to be one of them. So let's go ahead and take a couple of measures. 
If you have a mirror, you can use that to make this a little bit easier. If you have somebody that you live with that can hold a tape measure, that can make it a little bit easier. But honestly, I think you can probably get by with getting most of these measures by yourself. They don't have to be so precise. We're not measuring for stays or something like that where it needs to be very precise and you can't do it on your own. I'm gonna walk you through the process of taking the measures and we are going to need one, two, three, four, five measures for today. So the first measurement that we need is going to be shoulder to hem. And what I like to do is actually take the end of the tape and I like to dangle that down the front to be the hem, just like we did with the petticoat and apron where we used our string to do that. I just like to do it uh, with the tape measure because I think it's easier if you are measuring on yourself to be able to mark a measure here than to mark a measure down there. In front of the mirror, or if you have somebody you trust <laughs> and they can help you with this too, kind of adjust that to whatever length you think is kind of nice. And I've got a length right about there that I think is good. And I ended up at 44 inches. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that down. To give you some perspective, I'm about 5'5", five five, um, so I am a little bit shorter. Yours might need to be a little bit longer. I do like my shifts to come about two to three inches below my knee. You might want them to go a little bit lower. I definitely would not recommend shifts any higher than the knee. So they need to at least hit the knee or go below. But ultimately, it's a personal preference and there isn't a rule book that says this is how long your shift has to be for your height, for your weight, um, for your time period. Now, our next measure is going to be shoulder to shoulder across the back. The easiest way to do this by yourself is to grab your tape measure, kind of swing it behind your neck. You don't want to lift your arms for this part because that will give you extra. Relax your shoulders and find the shoulder bones. You'll find these kind of like pointy bits right at the edge of your shoulder. You can actually see it's almost where my t-shirt sleeves line up. Put the end on one bone and find the other. There we go. All right, I came out at about a little under 18 inches. So I'm just gonna round up to 18 because I know that I'm gonna want like seam allowance in there as well. Next, let's go ahead and take our bust measurement. And for this measure, we're going to want to get the fullest point of the bust. And it can be a little bit loose. You don't want it to be super tight. This is really just a reference measure uh, to help us decide kind of how wide we want to cut our, our shift. So I'm coming in at just around 47 inches, which seems about right. We got a fuller bust. I'm just gonna write that down. And then really the next two measures that we're going to need are our sleeve length and sleeve width. For the length, we can go ahead and just take the end of our tape measure and we're gonna let that be the bottom of the sleeve, if you will. Kind of the same way that we did for our shoulder to hem. Um, now I like my sleeves to typically end for this style about an inch or so just above the bend of my elbow like you see there. So what I'm gonna do is kind of hang that where I want it to be. Then I'm gonna come up top. All right, so I'm finding that shoulder point that we had before. 
uh, for the shoulder to shoulder across the back measure. And I'm gonna put my tape there once I have it where I would like it to be lengthwise on my arm. Now it is important to note here, you don't want to like lift your arm up because you notice how I start to get extra on the tape measure there. There's some slack when I do that. It shortens the distance that it's going over and we don't want our sleeves to pull the neckline down. Um, so we wanna make sure that we kind of have a nice relaxed arm with that tail where we want it and then kind of pinch So mine ended up at about 11 inches, and that's going to put it just almost to the crease of my elbow. Now to determine the sleeve width, we're going to take our tape measure, and we want to find the fullest part of our bicep because this is going to be the biggest section that that sleeve has to go around. So find the fullest point. Now we're not taking a super tight measure here because obviously we need the sleeve to be a little bit loose, right? We wanna be able to move around in it a little bit. And the more that you wash your shift, you might find a small amount of shrinkage uh, even if you pre-wash the fabric just because they're gonna get a ton of wear. Uh, so it ends up being an extra, say, three inches or so. That includes my seam allowance as well, so I don't have to worry about calculating seam allowance later. And that puts me actually right at about 17 inches. So I am just going to round up to 17 because it was about just a quarter of an inch shorter. For now, that is gonna be the last bit that we need the tape measure for. We will need the tape measure later, probably in part three, um, but we can set that aside because we're not going to need it anymore. The next thing that we need to do is we need to take these measures and we need to convert them to a diagram. And again, there are three approaches to this project. You can cut with as little waste as possible. You can cut with the least amount of stitching. So you could actually utilize the width of your modern fabric to its fullest extent. Knowing that, it might leave a little more fabric left over. And of course, the third approach is cutting to replicate an original garment. All right, so back to our paper. To diagram a shift, one of the easiest ways that I find to do it is to actually diagram it on paper first. This helps me figure out any layout issues. It also helps me determine how I'm going to get the most economical cut from my fabric. To do that, we're going to need some paper and a writing utensil, some type of uh, ruler. That way when you are marking things out you can keep things roughly to scale because the whole point of making the diagram is to help us cut more economically and we need to make sure that we're fitting in kind of as much in each section as possible uh, to make sure that we're getting the best use out of our fabric. If you are using a ruler and plain paper that's fine. I actually really enjoy using dot paper. So if you are a journaler or you like to do uh, particular styles of planners, which I am, uh, dot paper is really great. We use it to take notes and I find it really great for diagramming shifts as well. You could use grid paper here. That's totally fine. Also, uh, I'm just going to use dot paper because it's what I like to use and it's also what I have on hand. I don't have any graph paper readily available. If you're trying to stay in right now, you can find free printables for uh, dot grid paper or graph paper really just by doing a Google search and then you can print one on your printer. We're going to plan this diagram around a shift on 30 inch wide fabric. So if you had 60 inch wide fabric, you could theoretically 
have that and you could cut two shift bodies out of either side. So it's just a really economical way to utilize the modern width. The closest width to this in the 18th century would be 7 eighths yard wide shift linen, which ends up being about 31 and some change. But I find that 30 works pretty well. Even at a 47 inch bust, um, this usually works out to give me two to three inches of ease in the chest of my shift. I don't like really bulky shifts around my bust um, because I find that it just ends up bunching underneath my stays, so I like it to be fairly close fit. If you are larger than a 47 inch bust, you might want to cut this at 32 or 33 inches. You just won't be able to get two bodies side by side. If you are petite, if you're very small, instead of 30, you might want to narrow it down to maybe 27 or 28 even. So what I'm going to do is I have actually already pre-marked my grid paper uh, to find the center dot, and then I've measured out 15 dots on either side to give me a width of 30 dots, and that means 30 inches, right? I'm just gonna mark that there. And I actually really like using uh, these clear rulers because they help me stay a little bit straighter when I'm marking. All right, so here is my 30 inch wide piece. And now I'm going to want to, again, go back to that center point. And remember my shoulder to shoulder across the back was 18 inches. So I'm going to count, uh, divide that by two, so nine, and I'm going to count then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm going to make a dot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've taken from that center and kind of marked out on either side the width of my shoulder area. Now I'm going to want to go ahead and mark the hem. So if I count down, this is like a little tedious because it's probably a lot of squares, but I counted down. 44 squares and I put a little mark I'm just gonna go ahead I'm gonna mark it the whole way across and you'll see why in just a minute um, but so there's my hem I have my, my top there my hem here and the next thing that I need to do is create the side because that's where I'm going to be cutting. I've marked my halfway points here. I've marked my halfway points here between the top and the hem and this is roughly the area that we see those gores being put in on a lot of shifts that survive in collections today at least in English collections. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from the top point here and we want to intercept that halfway point. And we're just going to make this line the whole way down. So from there to there, but extend the line all the way down. And so now you can see we actually have these two, um, I think, what are they, like tangential triangles. Uh, if this one flips over, it becomes this one. And that's exactly what will happen if this is how you cut your shift. So if you're cutting your shift at 30 inches, uh, you will cut this later. This will flip and become this section here. We're going to do that same thing to the other side. And I'm a little off center on this, so you can't see the other side, but it's, it's fine. Um, this is really what I needed was I needed one whole section here. I'm just going to, because it's bothering me, I'm going to go ahead and draw the top line here as well. 
Wait. So this is our shift body and you can see that from that 44 inch length, uh, we haven't wasted any fabric. So everything in the square will become part of the shift. Now I'm actually, we have a little bit down here, but I'm going to flip this over and I'm going to grid out a second length of fabric that will start here. So now I have my 30 inches wide that I'm working with. And we're going to, I'm going to draw a line here because we're going to assume that I'm cutting this right at the bottom of the shift. So this should be the shift body here. And then this will start right underneath the body. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to look at my sleeves and my length is 11. My width is 17. This is 30 inches across. So I can't do the two widths because my arms are too large. If your sleeve was 15 inches around, you could just cut both of your sleeves from this section right here. My sleeves can't do that, so I'm going to have to rotate them. So I'm going to count 11 squares over, and I'm going to count 17 squares down. I'm actually going to count 11 more squares over so I can get both of my sleeves side by side. So I don't forget what I've done here. So I've got both of my sleeves. Now you might think we're done, but don't forget we need to have those two gussets for the sleeves and we also need two sets of reinforcement strips. So we need reinforcement for uh, the kind of arm side over the shoulder area and we also need that reinforcement to run along the top of the shift. And that's just a really common component that we see, not only on shifts, but on shirts as well. Most gussets tend to be four to five inches. Uh, I know that because I like my shifts to be cut a little bit on the generous side, I'm gonna go with five inches to cut that because I know I'm gonna have that seam allowance that I need to have in there as well. So my finished gusset should be around four inches. So I'm gonna go five over. I'm going to go 10 down because I can get both of them out of this nice little square. Well, out of this nice little rectangle here. All right, so now I need my reinforcement strips. And this worked out really nicely for me because the reinforcement strips we generally see being about an inch finished. So we cut at probably an inch and a half um, to two inches unfinished. And you can see I have three inches here. So I can divide that in two and that gives me two one and a half strips that can go along the edge of my fabric. And for this one, I need long strips for that arm side over the shoulder reinforcement, which needs to be the width of my sleeve plus the two edges of the gusset. So I have 17, uh, 27. So here's my sleeve plus one gusset. I need to do one more gusset. And that should do it.
just like to label everything. So the only thing left that I need would be my top of the shoulder reinforcements. And those are the same width often as uh, this reinforcement here, but they are obviously a lot shorter. Um, so I think what I'm going to do, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. My shoulder to shoulder was 18. Half of that was nine, but I know it's not going to need to go the whole way because I have a neck in the middle and I'm going to have that neckline cut out. So I think if I cut it at seven to put it at the bottom of my sleeve here, that will probably give me even a little bit extra because I anticipate this being kind of the width of my shift, which is really like maybe three to four inches. Um, but it doesn't hurt to have a little bit extra there just in case you need it. So I'm just going to let that go to the same bit there. I'm going to do one and a half here and then one and a half inches there. These are the shoulder reinforcements. And that's it. That's all that we need to cut. And you can see after my diagram, that is the only bit of fabric that I will have left that is not being used in the garment. And then of course the fabric here, but this is pretty whole in its state so it can be used for other projects. But this is the only scrap that I will have that wasn't used. So this is really good economical cutting. Now, if you wanted to cut using the whole width of your fabric, your diagram is going to look a little bit different. It's going to look a little bit more like this. If we're using all 60 inches, this is not perfectly to scale, by the way. The body here is a little bit smaller, just so I could show you uh, on this size paper what this would look like. Um, but you would essentially put the full body with those integrated gores here, just like the Garcal image. Uh, if you look, you can see that the image here, the gore is integrated on one side, but not on the other side. If you want to, and you don't want to have to stitch those other seams, you could take and cut your whole body out of the full width of fabric, uh, integrating the gores on both sides instead of just one side like we saw in Garçon, and then fit the other components in around the body. I want to point out though, remember your body will be cut on a fold. So the top of your shoulder gets put on the fold. So when you go to cut the rest, you don't need to cut them on the fold. Uh, it'll actually waste even more fabric to do that because you'll have really funky shapes that have been cut out of all of this fabric. But it actually works better to kind of open it up and then cut them from those other places. Look at the amount of waste that you see on this diagram. So we have all of this here. We have all of this here and not a lot of it is super usable. There are a few usable sections here. You might be able to use some of this here. You can maybe make a ruffle or a tucker out of this here, but just look at the difference in waste. So here we have a tiny bit of waste. Here we have a large portion of waste. If you can use all of these scrap pieces for things, then I think this is a viable option and I think that's fine. If you don't have an idea for what these could be used for, I would just be hesitant to go this route because of the amount of waste that it creates. So regardless of which diagram or cutting method you choose, uh, because it is your choice, uh, we are ready to now actually move on to start marking these points on our actual fabric. So you want to get your fabric and measure out the length that you want that to be from shoulder to hem. 
And once you have that, go ahead and hold that point and you want to fold it over. And now I actually have cut mine, I've trimmed it so that this is just the body. So I'm not working with the other bits at this point um, because I don't have the room to have that much fabric hanging around. So this will just be my body. So once we have the length cut and folded, and we do recommend pulling threads when you're cutting anything that is on straight of grain, uh, the next thing that we need to do is take our diagram and we're going to now transfer some of those points onto the fabric. Now I am going to be cutting two bodies out of this just because it's a better use of the fabric this way. So I'm just going to go ahead and fold it again. I'm going to mark my center with a pin. I need to cut this apart. Remember I said that I'm making two. And to do that, I'm gonna need to pull a thread. So that's gonna take a minute. But I would rather pull a thread and get it right in the middle than not pull a thread and have it be really, really wonky. So I remember I marked that center. And sometimes pulling on grain can be a little bit harder than pulling cross grain. It just depends on the linen. This is a really nice linen with uh, like really fine threads because I like really lightweight shifts because I get hot very, very easily. Um, but I'm just gonna pull this. I know it can seem kind of annoying sometimes to pull threads, uh, especially if you're not one of those people who like those really kind of um, zen uh, <laughs> tasks, but it is worth it, I think, to pull threads because you just get a much better set of pieces to work with which prevents just a lot of problems later on in the process. Because now I'm going to fold this over. I'm going to find center for this section. I'm going to mark that as well. All right, and now we're going to start taking this diagram and we're just going to mark everything out on the fabric so that we can cut. So I know that I need to go eight inches over from center. So I'm going to line my piece up at eight. I'm going to go out to 16. And then I'm going to go down to zero. So that gives me my shoulder width. And then the nice thing here is because I went halfway uh, for my intersection point, I can actually just take this and fold it in half to get that point. Mark my point there. Perfect. So the next thing we are going to do is we are going to go from here to here with our straight edge. 
And this is why we want to make sure that we're keeping this fabric as kind of flat and even as possible because we're going to have to draw on this. You can use a pencil, which is what I prefer to do. You could pin this line as well, but I find that it's just easier for me to just have that light pencil there. And then what I'll do is when I go to cut it, I'll pin along the inside to keep things nice and flat. And so once you've done that, cut right along that line. We've already kind of factored in seam allowance, so I'm not super worried about that. These are generous garments to begin with. When I get to the top, I'm just gonna take that pin out. Perfect. So if I've done this right, uh, when I flip this over, so I'm gonna flip it that way and match the salvage up to the salvage. Hey, yay. Uh, we get this nice uh, kind of extension of that line. Now, I need to cut the bottom of this because remember that top was cut on the fold. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that very quickly. And voila, I now have my two uh, kind of gores for the bottom of my shift. All right, so now we just need to do the same thing for the other side. And we will be in business. And it's also not a bad idea to think about labeling things. So I like to use sticky notes. I'm sure you're surprised. Um, I even color code my sticky notes sometimes. Um, but I'm just gonna go ahead and label this so that if I put this away for a while and maybe don't get back to it, I don't forget what it is. And I'm just gonna Stick that pin through as much as I can. There we go. So now I can set these aside. Now we're just gonna take, say another length of our linen and we're going to essentially do the same thing that we just did, but instead of measuring out those points for our body, we're going to measure out the points for our sleeves, gussets, and reinforcements. So you can do exactly the same thing uh, by marking those points with pins, but here everything is on the grain or the cross grain. So we do recommend that with this part, rather than penciling the line like we did on the body, you actually pull threads to demarcate those cutting spaces. It's going to give you cleaner uh, truer shapes for your sleeves and gussets and reinforcements and it's just going to make it a lot easier to work with them later and you won't have so many like ravelly issue bits. So we'll go ahead and take a moment to do that and when that is done you should have your sleeves, gussets, and reinforcements and we can keep those with our shift body. And at this point, we are all prepared for next week where we will take these pieces 
and start putting them together. So go ahead and tuck these someplace safe for now. Grab a beverage of your choice and relax until next week when we will start stitching. Friends, thank you for joining us this week. And remember, we love hearing from you. So if you found this video helpful or you have questions or even ideas for videos in the future, go ahead and drop us a comment in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already so you get notifications when a new video goes up or when we go live for Q&As. And we can't wait to see your finished shifts in just a couple of weeks. But until then, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.